Oh man, I think you're going to find some hard to keep a good man down. Probably found that idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, our our state data is remarkable. Yeah. It, well, it really was if I wasn't doing that. Uh, 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 <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We just asked that uh, if you have not checked in over there with your temperature and sent some check with Melissa, we would Melinda, we would appreciate it. And if you don't ask that you just keep your mask on for the duration of the meeting with your mouth and nose covered. We appreciate it. Thank you. Order roll call, please. Dr. Brenner? Here. Dr. Missoula? Here. Dr. Schumacher? Here. Mr. Sutner? Here. Mr. Schiff? Here. Here. And Dr. Burke? Here. Uh, and then pledge of allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then with someone who needs a mission statement, please. Cultivating learners who apply skills and experiences to enrich society. Okay, thank you. And then we have public comments. Yeah, we have Yeah. Hello, my name is Rachel Juarez, and I'm a social studies teacher at Yorkville High School and the president of the Yorkville Education Association. I speak tonight as president of the YAA. To Dr. Schiff and the Yorkville Community Unit School District 115 Board of Education. The work put into the plan for reopening scenarios has been incredible. Dr. Schimpf, we appreciate your work and that of your team, along with the many staff members who are working so diligently to come up with plans for face-to-face -face learning, remote learning, and hybrid learning models. I have poured over those plans and talked with many such group leaders on multiple occasions. To say that educators want to be back in the classroom is an understatement. In-person learning is what is best for our students, not just academically, but for their social emotional well-being. However, physical health and safety must be the top priority. And the Yorkville Education Association believes that as of today, having educators and students return to the building for the start of the coming school year will unnecessarily create an unsafe environment for many if safety protocols are not operational. That is why we believe at this time, Remote learning is the best option. It is the recommendation of the YEA that we begin the school year in our remote learning model until the district is able to determine how to implement all safety protocols and procedures, which includes having necessary supplies available in all buildings. As of the writing of this recommendation, we recognize that the plans for the district are comprehensive in nature, but there are still some important and unanswered questions in regards to safety of students and staff. As you are aware, the YEA recently conducted an internal survey, and 77.5% of respondents replied to that that they were in support of the YEA recommending to the district and the Board of Education that we begin the 2020-21 school year in a remote learning, in remote learning, due specifically to safety concerns. We want to be transparent with each of you. We have approximately 595 current members, and we have, as we have yet to sign up incoming staff members. And with 493 respondents, we've had an 83% response rate. We do recognize and thank Dr. Simp for being a leader who is truly listening to the concerns of his staff and is working daily to help alleviate their well founded fears about safety when returning to the building. And we are hopeful that before the first day of school, 
the district will be able to have all safety protocols fully operational in every building. However, if safety protocols are not in place by the start of school, then we hope that the district and the board will agree that remote learning is best until those are operational. We appreciate the many suggestions that have been offered by the district in regards to safety, and we are looking forward to seeing those solutions come to fruition. I would also like to take this opportunity to state that safety implementation does not just rest in the hands of the district. The YEA understands that we have a dual responsibility in the implementation of safety procedures. No safety protocols will be successful without the staff working alongside the district and vice versa. The YEA is committed to providing a high quality education to our students. We are the experts in the classrooms at Y115. We will be able to deliver comprehensive learning experiences for our students through a reasonable and well-developed remote learning plan. We do not believe that we will be able to deliver a comprehensive learning experiences accepted by the students and the parents and students in the face-to-face -face model without fully addressing the current safety concerns. The YEA is fully committed to working to provide quality education to our students while upholding the safest conditions for our students and staff. Our productive working relationship with the district is one of which we are quite proud, and we look forward to continuing to collaborate as district wants to see moves forward with the open, reopening plan and the continued implementation of safety protocols and procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, very much for your presentation. And I think we all agree that the safety protocols have to be in place before the first day of school. And we are diligently working on, on making sure that's a reality, as well as making sure that we phase that in to students and not just dump all of them in your lab the first day. Uh, and of course, working collaboratively is the only way we're going to solve this. And uh, I believe that uh, we will be able to make that happen. And um, we want to thank the 100 member um, committee, six committees, 100 members, administrators, staff, Rachel, you were part of that, teachers were part of that, parents were part of that. Um, and we'll hear those plans later. And some of this, I also understand that this could be addressed, many of the issues that uh, Rachel has brought to you, and we are confident that we'll be able to address those. And hoping to even put additional layers of safety protocol to make sure everybody is safe. Rachel, I appreciated your comment. We're in this together. We all own this. Every single one of us has a signing what we do during the school day. It's what we do after school. It's what we do in the evening. And we all have to partner up and we all have to be committed to these procedures so our kids can continue to learn in the best environment and giving our parents the flexibility and the needs so they can ensure their students can learn at their best ability. So if anyone else wants to add, we're going to talk more about these plans later on in the agenda. Okay. I believe we have um, the recognition. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, it's a little bit of fun. Tough that to follow, Rachel, but I'll see what I can do. Um, the first recognition I'd like to um, have come up is Mr. Anthony Hansen. Sure. Anthony uh, is a familiar face to many of us uh, as a parent um, and a great supporter of our community. Uh, the Board of Education recognizes Anthony Hansen. For a distinguished service award of excellence from the Illinois chapter of the National School Public Relations Association for the work on behalf of your school district 115. This award recognizes those who make a difference in their school community by helping promote public education and enhance its programs and services. Nominees are valued on their ability to support or improve understanding and communication in the school or the district. 
foster cooperative partnerships between the school and community and strengthen the overall support for education by stakeholders. Christine Liptrap, our communications person in the district, said the Distinguished Service Award is an opportunity to honor those deserving individuals who persistently advocate for public education in our state. These individuals work tirelessly to highlight and to highlight the successes of the public schools. They understand the importance of building strong public relations and provide all members of the school community the opportunity to promote excellence and be champions of students and employers. School, school communicators from 13 different states judge the entries against the criteria of excellence, and only those who receive top scores receive the award. Winning nominations either receive an award of merit or for those receiving the highest evaluation, an award of excellence. The mission of INSTRA is to provide a source of connection, collaboration, and professional development for school communicators in order to strengthen support for Illinois public schools, which leads to greater student success. The 2020 Distinguished Service Award of Excellence goes to Anthony Anson. Anthony has been a, a source of, of support uh, as a, a PTO member in the district over the years, um, a CAC member. He's been on the Evolution 115 team, uh, the transition team that we're speaking of tonight. Um, and he was instrumental in the VR Yorkville website uh, back in the spring. So thank you, Anthony. The next recognition uh, I would like to call is for Christina Trout. The Illinois chapter of the National School Public Relations Association presents the 2020 Distinguished Communicate Award to Christine Lipchow. In her decades of serving as a school communications professional, she's been an impactful champion for public education within the variety of districts she has served. In her current role, she's under the admiration of the school community as she balances the need to nurture and cultivate strong relationships while maintaining a tenacious and unwavering determination of continuous excellence and, and improvement. Through her years, Christine has demonstrated her ability to work with a critical eye for improvement, sometimes to my own demise, but still respect the opinion of others, the uniqueness of individuals and groups, and the needs of the organization over her own personal ideals or perspectives. Christine places such a high value and importance on communicating the truth with both accuracy and good judgment and works tirelessly to be proactive to ensure information is transparent, easily understood, and developed with such high levels of quality. The INSPRA president, Carol Smith, who works in St. Charles 303, Said Christine called to ask if I would serve as her president elect. I knew it was a perfect opportunity to learn from a veteran strategist and leader. I've been proud to be part of the work of this board as I witnessed Christine's ability to create a vision, set goals, and work with others to meet those goals. We are better chapter because of her leadership. And the words that I wrote weeks and months ago, I've been very appreciative of what she does in support of District 115. While I work beside Christine very closely every day, I'm appreciative of her tight, loose style of leadership. She remains firm on the non-negotiables and makes sound decisions on behalf of the district while supporting the autonomy, ideals, and values of the college. Congratulations, Christine. And the last uh, award is more of a district award, but certainly Christine was instrumental. And um, you know, this is Dr. Burke's coin, the, the video that we made years ago, you know, the South Park video. But we, uh, Christine worked, worked with the uh, company Plum Productions um, to create our Evolution 115 introduction. Um, so we were presented, uh, for Mitchell, Award of Excellence, presented to Yorkville 115 for Distinguished Achievement 
in a category of school district video produced with outside, outside contact with the resolution 15 into the district. Thanks, Gary. Can you hear me? Um, 
you know, the additional class that are going to be coming um, as a part of COVID. So we're really happy that we're able to be in that position as a district to, um, to again, give ourselves, give ourselves some room and some flexibility as we deal with that, what's coming up for the upcoming year. So that's really what I wanted to cover. I don't know if anybody has questions. Make a motion to approve the treasury report as presented. Second. Moved and second the additional comments. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And then on to some personnel references. Thank you, Mindy. Thanks. Thank you. I will uh, take this first one the, the substitute salary enhancement. Um, as we've been having discussions about. Um, Opening in the fall, and we do understand that the, the need for substitute teachers could very much be likely. Uh, in a typical year, we often run into the time where we have some shortage, but certainly as we head into this school year and the unpredictability, um, we we're looking for additional ways to attract and retain substitutes not only for a short period of time, but over the course of school year. Uh, our neighboring district, as we I believe, recently passed a sub rate of $125 a day. And so we are proposing uh, an, an increase in, in our district from 115 to 130, as well as an increase rate of $135 for those substitutes to demonstrate a commitment after the 15th day of substituting in our district. Um, and then we're looking also for the, the long-term substitute rate to move from 165 today a day to 185 for those that are on the TFMLA and long term needs. Yeah. 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 We anticipate um, about a 15% cost um, increase for the year total, so probably close to $100,000 if you were typical numbers as in the year. Yeah. 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 Motion to approve the District 115 substitute teacher daily rate increases as presented. Second. Moved and second additional comments. Um, I'm interested as well that what's the demand, the supply of course, with such a high unemployment rate. We were battling very low unemployment under 3%, I mean, some 3% in the state. So I'm interested to see what that, that, that labor supply tool is. And we have, as part of the human relations group, um, I've asked Troy Courtney and his team to be uh, serving our current substitutes from last year, and we will want that. Um, taking away to advertise, um, assuming the board approves us, and then putting a comprehensive training plan in place. And not only for the day to day typical things we would train substitute, but obviously the health, safety, and the protocols are going in place. So moved and seconded. Um, any additional comments? Roll call, please. Dr. Brenner? Yes. Mr. Sutner? Yes. Dr. Kinsella? Yes. Mr. Kozlowitz? Yes. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Ms. Shields? Yes. Dr. Burke? Yes. Uh, and then next is the IEA President Relief. So this is a um, recommendation that I am making uh, after speaking with uh, our IEA President Rachel, we heard from earlier today. Um, and the cabinet members that um, pitch Rachel is currently released as a, a point four, and I'm recommended for this coming school year that we um, support a 1.0 full release for Rachel. Um, as we've talked about, and we'll continue to talk about the, the strong relationship that needs to happen between the YA members and the board and the district administration. Um, we feel that having access to Rachel throughout the day when things come up. Um, we can make decisions quicker. We can be proactive and preventative in combat areas that might um, prevent some larger issues from happening. So I think it's fully supported by, by Rachel and the YA, uh, supported by the administration, and we would like your vote. Motion to approve the YA President 1.0 full-time equivalent release as presented. Second. Moved and seconded additional comments. Roll 
Yes. Um, applied tech program. Motion to approve the applied tech programming plan is presented. Second. second. Moved and second. Additional discussion? I just wanted to uh, mention to the board to make sure that they're fully aware of this is a, a very hard to fill position. We had a, a resignation um, and we've had this uh, posting out for over a month. And so the high school. Uh, understanding uh, how soon and how quickly the school year is approaching uh, has put forward a recommendation for some restructuring uh, that does include uh, Mr. Wyatt assuming the department chair responsibilities and as a request for a point two overload. Um, and also, um, we have a tentative agreement to have a retired teacher return to help fill some responsibilities. Um, roll call, please. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Mr. Sutter? Yes. 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 Mr. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Burke. Yeah. Uh, then we have a co-curricular resignation. I need a motion. Motion to approve the co-curricular resignation that's presented. Second. Moved and second. Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And then we have some co-curricular hires. Motion to approve the co-curricular hires as presented. Second. Moved in, second and any additional discussion? Yeah, these depend on these sports actually taking place, right? Should that be part of? That should be part of the motion. That should be part of the motion, motion I think. So, uh, can we amend the motion? I would amend the motion. Yeah. I would amend the motion to approve the co-curricular hires as presented given the state of uh, the sports taking place throughout the, the fall and winter. Okay. 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 Yeah, I just want to let, I've asked Corey Courtney, um, there's, a, there's a committee that works uh, each year when there's, when there's proposals for stipends or coaches. Um, changes, um, financial changes, uh, that they come together in January. I've asked Troy to bring that group back together. Because there's a lot of conversations, a lot of questions related to um, if we don't have athletics this year activities or clubs, do they get the year's worth of credit going into next year? You know, all fall for their to get stipends. You know, if we're allowed to have you know, no IHSA sponsored activities, but they say if you want to continue to do strength and conditioning or skill development, you know, is that our site in the pro or so I think there's a lot of questions out there. And I think it's to do due diligence, we need to bring that committee together with the coaches involved, with our athletic directors, with our activities directors, and then come back to the board with a recommendation. Yeah, so you better to table this motion. Well, I think you can approve them on the contingency of What's going to happen in the future? Well, we're not going to, if the board approves and we have basketball, we don't have to bring basketball back. Right. So yeah. we're not going to move forward with any of the sites without the board approval. Okay. You'll probably bring another motion based on Yeah, the and here's the list for the year, here's the plan for the year, or at least for the fall. Different and they see. Right. Right. And that's so what you're going to bring They're prepared for something that they may not have. So right. They're putting a ton of work. Yeah. So we will not pay anybody for this coming school year until we bring the board back the direction we're going by sport, by club activity, or as we want more. Okay. And that even is, we had our summer work session Monday. That's the whole, everything is closed. Yeah. All positions. So the structure is closed. Right. Right. The structure could change, which means the needs are different. Absolutely. So everything is closed. Absolutely. <clears throat> The motion on the table is to approve this contingent on future movement with COVID. Correct, mm -hmm. correct, correct. And second. And second. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Mr. Kozlovich? Yes. Dr. Brenner? Yes.
motion to approve the terminations as presented. Second. Moved and seconded from discussion, but let's do a roll call. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Kaplan? Yes. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Dr. Brenner? Yes. Yes. Mr. Sessner? Yes. Ms. Shields? Yes. Dr. Burke? Yes. And then we have some resignations. Motion to approve the resignations as presented. Second. Moved and second. Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. I would just like to say real quickly about that. I'm, Happy for Jeff Bursey, who is the AD at the middle school. Jeff has done a really terrific job over the years. I've worked with him personally through youth football and uh, sad to see him leave, but I know he's got good things coming his way as his principal at his new position. Hey, he's been a very loyal person to Yorkville. You know, I know I've talked to him a few times. Um, I know he's been involved in um, the executive content of that. And uh, Jenna, you can see what Lisa wrote about Jeff yeah. and what. Uh, He's done for York Middle School and, and, and for Lisa. School. And high school, yeah. Years of high school. That's yep. right. Here's the deal. Yeah, I really like how we found his niche with that junior high job and just kind of ran with it almost like it was a high school. So yeah, he's definitely like in a few minutes. So they'll like him down in the YC, but that's for sure. All right. Um, so all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to approve the hires as presented. Second. 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 I'm sorry to see former students of mine pop up on the hire list. No. Uh, Rose Paul, please. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Mr. Sepner? Yes. Dr. Brenner? Yes. Dr. Mitchell? Yes. Mr. Cowboy? Yes. Yes. And then we have a summer school hire. Um, look, there we capture. Just a, a leftover yeah. summer school hire. Okay. Okay. Right. Motion to approve the summer school hire. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, Roll call, please. Yes. Mr. Yes. Dr. Brenner? Yes. Dr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Dr. Brenner? Yes. Dr. Yes. And then on to new business and first agenda item is the district 115-2021 quality opening plan. So I will begin and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Balkman um, as the board and our community and Everyone in attendance here knows um, this has been going on for, for months, um, long before ISBE or IDPH came out with their guidance on June 23rd. Uh, our committee started um, end of May, beginning beginning of June, with the six subcommittees and the one oversight team. Um, if you look to the oversight team, certainly very um, well represented with. Parents, some in the audience tonight, and um, some of the administrators, uh, YA representatives and leadership. Um, we're very proud of the, the work that they all, the time, the effort, and the energy, and the ideas that they gave um, to the process. And then you can see we had six sub team leads in those areas, and the, I know the board's very aware as our plan is revolving around those six areas and all the questions and the plan. The implementation procedures, the protocols fall within each of those areas. Um, but again, um, great representation across the district in all job categories. For every member that requested to participate, we took them. We didn't exclude anybody. Um, we had a couple people who dropped out just for sort of personal reasons and family reasons, but we were all inclusive and uh, everyone gave a different, unique perspective to the work that we had uh, ahead of us. <coughs> If you go back to the Restore Illinois plan, this is very much in alignment to 
the work that we have done and will continue to do so. so. When you look at phase one and two, where we were last spring, where only our essential employees were on campus or our facility, the rest of our students were e learning from home. We moved to phase three, this was in June of this year, where we were starting to be allowed to have small packets of individuals, better or less. Um, we were given the opportunity to do some e-learning, or excuse me, face-to-face -face learning on site. We chose not to as a district in the month of June to wait and see how things fell out. And then for the athletics and clubs and activities, we were just waiting for, for direction um, as we moved through the summer. Phase four is where we are now, 50 people or less. Um, this is our camps have opened up at the high school and the middle school level. Um, we've had pockets of, of teams of 50 or less, obviously with math, social distancing, um, and it gives more of an opportunity for um, different models of instruction to occur. I think as we are moving forward, um, we're going to be very mindful of the governor's phases. Uh, we are going to adhere, adhere to IDPH. We're going to adhere to the ISPE guidelines as we have done from the very beginning. This is not a decisions that are made in isolation. These are not decisions that, you know, Superintendent Shim and his cabinet sit, sit back and say, we're going to go this direction that we have a go. We've been, we've been monitoring the IDPH website on a daily basis. We're tracking the data. Uh, we're taking ISBE, ISBE guidelines and those from the IDPH. We have the most recent update um, from the both the CDC as well as the IDPE last week. Uh, both have suggested that if able to do so, we should be sending kids back to school. Obviously, the distancing guidelines, the safety. And, and, and health related protocols in place, uh, maintaining groups of 50 or less, all those things that are spelled out in phase four of the two story Illinois plan. I think it's very important for our community, our staff, our board to know that at any point in time, we can revert back to phase three or phase two or phase one. We just don't know. It could happen between now and the start of the school year. It could happen for a school, a classroom, where we have to shut down one building, you have to shut down a group of kids or a classroom, and move them back to phase three, if you will, and send them home for a period of time until we get an uh, indication from our health department uh, and other sources that um, it's safe to go back. So this is gonna be very fluid. It's gonna be fluid throughout the school year. It could change by the time we start the so what we're going to present tonight um, is the three scenarios uh, that we are going to recommend to start the 2021 school year. As you can see on the slide, if we are in phase one and two, we are going to, it's going to be called restricted. That's the scenario. We're basically a dealing other than essential workers coming on campus. If the governor puts us back into phase three, then it's a look at either in the remote, or we could have alternative schedules. There might be certain individuals, targeted students, pockets of some of our primary learners that come in for a period of time. Again, maintaining the 10 or less, social distancing, but getting some of the human interaction. What we are advocating for for the start of this year is the choice scenario. Or as long as we're in phase four and phase five. For the governor's plan, and as long as our general county, the health department, IDPH, and the board of education here deem it's safe to be in school with restrictions planners, we will go with the three options. We are going to share with you tonight the schedule of our e learning remote that a family can choose, the on site face to face option that a family can choose, or the hybrid blended, which would be a combination of both. So that's our, our focus for this evening. When we get to the end and after the board asks questions, and we, there's going to be a resolution that I would ask that the board approve. And what that resolution grants is giving me the, the autonomy after speaking with Dr. Burks and the board 
to make a decision very quickly, should we have to revert for a building, a classroom, or a district to another mode, to another scenario? Instead of having to call a special board meeting, coming back and doing that. Um, I would never make a decision in isolation. I would never make a decision without communicating and getting authority from the board. Um, but just it, from a time standpoint, and to be able to respond um, effectively, you, you'd have that resolution to do that. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Boffman, who's going to go over each of the options by the grade level stands for the choice scenario. Thank you, Dr. Shemp. Um, as Dr. Shemp mentioned, the academic subcommittee uh, has been working to create uh, three options for families uh, to choose from. One option being an e-learning option, the other one is an on-site option, uh, and the third option, uh, each, each, each of the various levels, um, we're referring to as a hybrid or a, or a blended option. So, um, I'll start with the elementary uh, and then move on to the middle and then the high school and show some sample schedules um, for our board and for our community. Um, but the first distinction that I would like to make is that e-learning itself will be a much more rigorous experience for our students than when we first went into phase one or two of the plan uh, in the fourth quarter. And so if an elementary family opts for the e-learning option. Their students will be asked to participate in five hours of daily instruction, which includes 90 minutes of live Zoom calls with the teacher. And then the rest of the courses are facilitated through consistent online platforms that we have the district um, have, have purchased. One is a platform for early childhood through second grade students called Seesaw, and the other one is Google Classroom. There's well, also- you have, this, you have this document in front of you, right? Uh, there also is a uh, physical education uh, requirement that students participate in 150 minutes of um, PE or health related activities that will be completed independently at home. And students can then choose one of their specials courses, which is ILP, art, or music. If a family did want to choose more than one, we would allow uh, for that provision. But our expectation is that they must participate in at least one of those specials where attendance is required to receive a grade. From an elementary on-site standpoint, we have um, developed safety protocols and restrictions. So if families choose the on-site option, um, it will be a regular school day, approximately 825 to 325 or 835 to 335, uh, depending on if it's a grade school or an elementary school or, or an intermediate school. We will have um, an integrated curriculum. So we're integrating um, ELA with uh, science and social studies. This did a couple of things for us. It allows for us to create um, some cross-disciplinary experiences, but it also freed up time in the schedule for additional things like transition, social emotional learning, and a different um, time and pace in which um, students think just take time to wash hands and, and follow proper safety uh, and health protocol. Um, we also uh, are recommending that lunch is happening in the classrooms. Um, and also we have staggered recess times throughout the day. And so we'll have specific zones at a recess that um, students were allowed to be in, uh, which will help us um, control for social distancing. Our students um, also have the option of a hybrid schedule. And this is basically students attend in person three hours a day to get their academic core instruction areas. Um, but then they will also have to complete two hours of um, independent asynchronous practice, which will be engaging uh, with our curriculum online via a variety of different uh, platforms um, or teacher created uh, assignments. Uh, in all three of the items or in the options, um, we will be following the same district curriculum and students will be um, participating in the same assessment uh, process and protocol to ensure a rigorous experience that is accountable. From a middle school perspective, uh, we still have the same or similar three options uh, for families to choose from uh, with the restrictions uh, in place that we had mentioned. Um, from a middle school perspective, um, I want to share a schedule uh, with you to help me explain uh, the difference between a hybrid option in a middle school and that of an elementary school. In an elementary option, students would come for half a day in the morning or the afternoon and participate in academic instruction also with a recess in there. 
For a middle school hybrid option, our families have the choice to choose between a core team flex instructional time to take those in person or online, but they can also choose to take the PE or electives in person or online as well. The core team flex instructional block of the day um, is co-planned by teachers and with, with allowing them to have flexibility to um, move between content areas in an interdisciplinary approach. Um, this is an instructional shift for us in our approach to um, our core content areas, but we believe our teachers, when they co-plan together, can have more freedom to choose how much time they're spending in each content area as appropriate to meet those standards. Uh, and so in this example, uh, if a family chose to um, the hybrid option and they wanted to come in person for core team flex instruction, they would show up in the morning. Uh, they would then participate online for their PE and or elective course uh, options. That could also be reversed. Families could also choose to come to school for their PE and or elective options, or they could choose and then take their core team flex instruction time um, at home. Uh, we still have an e-learning option uh, that's available for our families as well, um, and also um, a full on-site option uh, for our families to choose from. Um, from a high school perspective, uh, we still have the, the three models that the high school students can choose from, uh, e-learning, on-site, uh, or hybrid, um, in-person. The hybrid model um, is the preferred model at the high school, meaning um, students will attend two days uh, in class, in-person, and then attend remotely uh, for two days. This allows us to uh, limit the number of students that are on uh, campus uh, at any given time to allow for greater social distancing. Uh, from a scheduling perspective, as we had discussed uh, at the previous, at the previous uh, working session um, with the board, we've modified and changed the schedule so it's visually cleaner and um, understandable for families. Um, and so in this example here, um, students would be assigned to a team. Uh, this example is calling Team Fox and Team Den. <laughs> Um, in this example here, uh, on Monday and Tuesday, which is represented in the white columns, students would be assigned to a team, Team Fox or Team Den. Um, the Team Fox would then come to campus um, on Monday and Tuesday, while the students that are in Team Den would uh, participate in their class remotely. They would go through their entire schedule, odd periods on Monday, and um, even periods on Tuesday, in an 85-minute uh, block schedule format, which allows for less transition times throughout the course of the day. Then students would then switch, and those that were in Team Fox would now participate in, uh, in their education on campus, and then uh, Team Den would participate um, in their, excuse me, Team Fox would be remotely and Team Den would be on campus. So basically, it's two days on uh, and, and then two days uh, remote instruction. We still have the option for families uh, who want to come in uh, every single day. That is an option uh, for families as well. But we also have the option for families who want to participate 100% remotely um, to also be able to do that um, as well. And so we do understand that uh, a lot of professional development needs to be required in order to have a rigorous uh, experience and a block schedule, it's something that's going to be new for our staff. And we're developing lesson templates, uh, course blueprints, and also professional development sessions. Um, so staff is prepared to teach uh, within, this new, within this new model. Uh, we also understand that our grading practices um, will need to be evaluated. And so we're bringing groups back together um, to ensure that we have a rigorous assessment system that promotes accountability, engagement, and also equity uh, for our students. So I'll be bringing back information to the board to report out um, what, what has happened during that committee and make any recommended changes um, if necessary.
part of this slide, I want to just share a few more things related to the schedule. Um, as we've been talking and getting fielding questions from the association or union, as we're looking at training planners and protocols, we've had some discussion at the district level about as we start the school year um, to do some possible staggered schedules for kids. And I don't mean, you know, out, you know, two, three weeks. Um, but when we look at the August 20th start date, there may be an opportunity for us to bring together, you know, our EC2 kids on that Thursday and Friday. And then on Monday, Tuesday, they would stay home and other group of kids would come in for the rest of the school. We'd look at it by grade level. Our K3 buildings might be a little bit different how they break that up. And our K6s might be a little bit different as well as our four, five, six. Same thing with the middle school. We might bring our seventh graders in on uh, August 20th and 21st, do training, have them go through lunches, drop up and pick up, and then flip and have our eighth graders come in the next few days. While the kids are at home, they would then also be expected to do the remote learning part of it. So all of our teachers would be in the building, all our teachers would be interacting with kids, but it would also give an opportunity from the remote standpoint, if we have to make a quick transition to the class or the school, they at least have some understanding of what that might look like. Um, I think the value we'll bring to staff into our building is we can do things collectively, observe, um, troubleshoot before then, what I would recommend, like August 26, everybody's there all day that's supposed to be a person person or half the day, whatever they get to. It's something that I've asked our principals to give consideration to. We're coming back together with them on Thursday of this week. So we'll have more dialogue around that. It might be an idea that goes flat and we say that the course that we have proposed, um, but I don't see anything else drastically changing with the schedule. Um, I understand parents need to make plans, uh, daycare, child care. So we're gonna get, make a decision fairly quickly and then we communicate it back out to the board and to our community. The other thing I'd like to share is that as we look at the health and the wellness piece of it, as well as the academic, there's gonna be a great need for us to monitor the outcome, monitor the, uh, the progress that we're making for areas concerned. So I am gonna be proposing um, that we bring together two separate committees, two monitoring committees, one will focus on academics, and one will focus on health and wellness. I see these much like our oversight team, but adding other community members from our, our healthcare professionals, from um, our town county health department, possibly on EPH, um, possibly a business leader or two, to get perspective what's going on in the community of businesses. And from a health and wellness standpoint, we would spend time twice a month either virtually or in person, um, looking at what the numbers are shown in, in the area, um, looking at the district health data data, looking at obviously with privacy, but looking at what's going on with our employees, what's going on with our students from a health standpoint, our guidelines, our parameters, our protocols. And then from an academic standpoint, we would be looking at those things that we look at for academic success, whether that's assessment data, grades, uh, student performance, student engagement. Uh, we look at our counseling numbers. We look at our attendance rates. Um, midpoint satisfaction surveys for parents. I think it's going to be really important for us as a district to come together as a community and, and have some indicators of success, indicators of progress, or certainly indicators of things are going astray. So we need to maybe change gears. We can be proactive, we can be preventative. Um, and we can have, be able to share more relevant data with the board and our community. And I do think that will also help as we start talking about anxiety and stress and, and fear returning if we know that we have a group of people that are constantly monitoring it and that we will proactively uh, make some changes if necessary. Heather, do you want to talk to some of these on the slide? Or 
this is where we are and when we look at the from the safety and hygiene standpoint and ordering and uh, i know that's a lot on a lot of people's minds about you know do we have access to the supply uh, do we have the things in today do we have barriers up do we have plexiglass in our offices so yeah. we do have all um supplies available we have hand sanitizer we have the two and wipes we have gloves it's everything that um we had at the end of the school year we've been able to maintain and keep over the summer so we do have all that available for the students and staff um we also um are adding more of what we used to have so where we used to have hand sanitizer in certain areas of the school we'll have more of that available throughout can you hear me Sorry. more of that available throughout um, each building. Uh, we are going to be installing protective barriers in each school, so we'll be having them in the front offices, and we will also uh, be having them, secretary's desks, we'll have them in the libraries at the circulation desks. So we are doing that. We have also um, purchased urinals, like their screens to so go in between each urinal throughout the whole district and for sinks. So we'll have that as, um, as well. We are in the process of creating classrooms that are six feet distancing between desks. Um, once we hear back from the uh, parents from the survey, then we'll be able to have an exact on what each room and the amount of students will be in those rooms, but we're waiting for that to come back. But we do have a template for each school that we would like to use. Um, I think that's a... Mm -hmm. The six foot distancing, if you look at the CDC, they talk about when feasible. When you look at the IDPH and the IEP, they talk about when possible. We are going to make every effort, and uh, we're going to rely on our staff to help, that, help us do that, to keep kids six foot apart. Um, it's not always going to be possible. It's just not. And I think that's important for the board to know, it's important for our community to know that they make decisions. Um, but when you look at the other requirements of face masks being worn at all times, um, that's going to be really important. Um, but you know, we're going to do everything we can from a, you know, we're headers to clean our classrooms. We have ordered 40 foot storage units that you're going to see over by the maintenance area where all that stuff that's currently in classrooms is going to go. Um, we're going to be asking our classroom teachers who have personal couches and lawn chairs and comfort furniture. That's probably going to be most of it coming out, depending on the numbers of kids, obviously. We'll have to, we'll have to gauge that as our parents make choices and we can look at unique class sizes. Um, we're going to be, we're reviewing section numbers. You know, there's some concerns that when we look at the middle school, um, you know, historically, when classes would be at 32 or 33 at a middle school, you know, we, we train to say, can we limp through that for a semester or um, we, not, we may not be able to do that this year, so we're going to have to look at what, what sections are that size and what are the, the numbers of those families and those students who've selected um, the model that they, they've, been, they've, been, they've been offered. Um, we're also going to be doing checklists for restrooms and bathrooms and we'll have the custodians, we have a checklist for every restroom, we have a checklist for the stairwells, everything being cleaned and disinfected, that they'll be going through sensory rooms in the school. So we'll have that and they will have what they need to clean throughout the day on an hourly basis and then um, sign off on that. So that is something that we're creating right now as well. Um, Can you think about the A and PM for the, the kids who choose, the parents who choose a half day at the elementary level? We will have um, people coming in to clean those classrooms in between sessions. Um, Heather's also looking at a, a UV device where you can put it in a classroom, close the door for 10 minutes, and it cleans the, it disinfects the entire area. So, yeah, we were looking at purchasing 10 of those once we reach school so that we're able to move that around and use that for AM and kindergarten. Um, it takes about 10 minutes, so it'll help um, with the cleaning and disinfecting procedures for the schools. Um, so, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, I know a lot of people have questions about our HVAC. Um, we have, first of all, I have our, our maintenance supervisor 
he helped me out a lot, David Yodell, with if he's here today, with, with everything with HX. So I learned a lot with him. And what we have is it's called a dust free mini split system. So we're able to have each room have their own thermostat and each room has its own meter back. And we're able to set each room separately. So um, by doing that, we're starting our systems a little bit earlier and ending them a little bit later every day. So that way it helps keep more air movement in the building. Um, we also have uh, our, our outside air intake is usually at 10% and we're increasing that to 30%. So it's bringing more fresh air into the building and exhausting the building return air. So it helps remove the amount of recycled air in, in our classrooms and in our buildings. Uh, the exhaust fans are running longer to take that out. So that's also helping with what um, we're trying to accomplish. Um, so I know that people have asked what we're doing for COVID cases. If we have a COVID case, as far as our HVAC is concerned, um, we do shut down the unit for a 24 hour period. That'll be the plan to shut those down. And then while the custodians are cleaning, we'll close off all those areas. And then the filters will be removed. And then we'll put new filters in. And then we'll also use a spray and ozone disinfectant spray on the new filter before we install it. So that is what we'll be doing for the 24 hour period um, in all the multiple classrooms um, that were affected. Does that have any questions? So from a, a timeline standpoint, um, assume you're hopeful for plenty of approval tonight from the board um, with a resolution. We would be sending an email out tomorrow morning to all the families um, with the options and the description um, for fairly lengthy communication that will go out. Um, after that, in order to make sure that we're not bombarding families with the same document three different times if they have three students, by noon they're going to get another email with a student's ID on it and a separate, so if I have two kids, you get two of these emails, but it won't be the entire document for the entire plan again. Um, so that'll be by noon. Um, tomorrow night we have a District 115 employee update that I'll be over seeing and facilitating and um, update the, all of our 900 some employees of what's going on and where we're at. Uh, dual language deal is going to be having a meeting on Wednesday night that all of the cabinet members and some of our building leadership will be attending. Thursday we are meeting with our principals this week uh, from 8 to 1. Our elementary principals are coming in from a little bit early from their vacation for summertime. I know that most of them haven't had a whole lot of that. Um, and then our oversight team is meeting in the afternoon on that day. Um, and then in the evening, our PTO and our users wide open. So we're going to ask that our families return their decision, their commitment, by Friday at the end of the day, by 5 o'clock. If we do not hear from families, we are going to assume that they have chosen the on site full attendance. Obviously, we will probably reach out to them after that just to confirm and try and get them to an interaction going. But for our numbers and, and our planning purposes, that's what we'll go with. And for our high school students, uh, the preferred option would be the hybrid schedule. So that would be the two days in attendance and then two days virtually. I'm also outlined in that uh, email, uh, we're asking for parents to commit uh, for a nine week period of time. And that way, if something changes, uh, they can uh, have another option to select for the second quarter. Uh, a different type of education model. The last thing I want to share is, you know, Rachel talked about the survey that the union put out. Um, the district also sent in, you guys have a, a copy of some of the results in the back of your packet. Uh, but we sent the survey out of the district. Um, a couple of things, um, there were 630 roughly respondents. They went out to certified and non-certified. Um, we had 15% that answered that they had a documented medical health condition that will put them at high risk to return face to face. Obviously, our HR department um, will be looking at you know roughly 90 people here um, from this survey and taking each on a case by case basis to determine what the health condition is and, and how we respond accordingly. 67% of the 630 uh, were either neutral or comfortable 
you know, three, four, or five and return it partially for 67%. And then about 51% were comfortable returning to full in person learning. They're either neutral at three or four or five and uncomfortable or very comfortable. Um, we asked if they, if they could choose what mode of learning would they prefer to work. 40% said face-to-face, 37% said remote, and then 23% said blended. So that's very huge. Um, we asked if they'd be willing to teach a class outside of the normal work day. So I know that was a conversation we had with the board. Um, and about 38% said they would. So whether it's in the evenings, whether it's on weekends. So I think it's always something we need to be considering, especially as if we have to transition to other modes or our, our county goes in a different direction, or we just see it's a better fit for our, our staff and our learners. So I think what, what that survey reminds us of is that as we get through this week and we start looking at parent responses, the really hard work begins of setting up and aligning what our staff is willing or able to do or can't do for that matter in some of them with what our parents are asking for for their students. And how do we create those sections and structures and class sizes and um, so it's, it's going to get really busy really quick once this data continues to, to come in. Um, starting from now. I, I just want to say I, I'm, as a superintendent, you know, you, you, you never wish this upon our kids, our staff, our community. I mean, it, it just breaks your heart um, to watch kids go through this and, and our staff go through it. And, um, but I, I'd never want to be anywhere else to go through something like this. The, the amount of professionalism that our staff has shown, our parents have, have shown, you know, the emails of support, regardless of where people feel they are and what we should do or can't do, there's been a tremendous amount of support by our union, by our parents, by our business leaders, our chamber. Um, it's just never ending. And you as the board, um, so I just want to thank everyone who's contributed to the plan, who's given up countless hours of time and energy. Um, it's just, it's amazing. Um, and it's, it's overwhelming to think of the amount of, um, how many people come to, our, to the table and want to help out. Um, and I just, I can't think of community enough. It's gonna, it's only gonna get harder, but there's no doubt we're gonna, we're gonna prevail. We're gonna do really good things for kids. Um, I'm talking about that. Our plan will be in place. We will, we will make this work. People are gonna get sick. Kids might get sick. Staff might get sick. Community members. I mean, I don't think we all can be naive enough to think that it's not gonna happen. But we can minimize that. We can provide options for our families and we can support the heck out of people throughout the process. And, and I think having options for kids to give any sense of normalcy if they choose to do that. And we've talked about it as a group, the concern for the future of our, of our kids. When you think about our primary learners, when you think about the kids from a mental health standpoint, depression, anxiety, um, stress, it is, you know, the concern about what's that impact going to be long after COVID. You know, kids are kindergarten, the first grade and second grade, learning to read, learning to write, learning to do all the things that we've come to just, you know, expect from year to year to year. Um, so we are going to do everything we can as a district to minimize that long-term impact from an academic and a social emotional. And, and, and I mean that from our staff as well. Our staff is also, much like all of us, dealing with the new normal. And it's not easy. Our staff are stressed, our staff are, are scared. Our staff probably have, you know, dealing with their own mental health in pocket. So um, we just need to look out for each other and take care of each other. And I'm, I'm confident our community will do that. So I'll open it up to questions of the board for any of the cabinet members. If you're a committee member, can you raise your hand if you're part of the work? So thank you for all your help, and I'm sure they would be willing to answer questions too. But I'll turn over the board.
I'll start out and then I'll hand it off to my colleague. Um, Dr. Chimp and your team, thank you for mobilizing this plan for the mobilizing in April. We started planning in April. I sat in on a school board president meeting, I believe, in May, and school districts were spinning. Dr. Chimp, you and your leadership mobilized the team, empowered people, and started people to be proactive. We didn't wait for the state. We started mobilizing and coming up with a plan together. Um, while it seems like this was a short summary to the board, Dr. Schiff has given us updates almost every week. Um, he has sat down, Dr. Bachman has sat down with each and one of us, sometimes painfully, <laughs> has been very um, judicious and calm and patient with a lot of our feedback and feedback. We took some of that feedback we have interacted with every piece of this plan since, since the teams were mobilized. We most recently spent all day last Monday going over some additional feedback where we had additional open conversations about the plan. Um, I am so thankful for our community and our school community and the hundred people that stepped up to the plate, got into the arena and came up with a solution. I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. Um, it, it pains all of us. School is everything to these kids. You guys are everything to these kids. You're their czar and czarina. Sometimes you're the only role model that they have. And we just cannot thank you enough for mobilizing, coming together, and we trying to ensure there's some sort of normalcy. One of the other little assets that we have on our board is the chief of staff of, at Rush Tapley. It's a nice little um, resource to have in our pocket. And Dr. Petula, well, not only is he helping in the Rush Tapley community, he takes just time, just he's, he's selfless about the time he does with Dr. Kemp um, as well. Dr. Brenner, I think you've read every publication, no demand that has been published about every school opening in the entire global economy. And he also shares that with the, the board as well. Um, so I read other districts' plans. This is the best plan I've seen. This is better than the plan we've seen in our global community. This is better than some of the plans we've seen in Germany. This is one of the best plans I've seen. You guys rock. So I'm going to open it up to my to my colleagues for additional comments. I do not cannot tell you how thankful we are for all of you and your efforts. Dr. Burks, if you don't mind, I'd like to just say a few words. I want to echo everything you just said as far as the reopening plan. I, I, I am astounded at the level and quality of, of of this plan going forward and what we're what we're attempting to do. Um, I think the, the protocols that we have in place, we're going to do everything we possibly can to keep our students, our teachers, our staff safe. And uh, I, I'm very, very appreciative. Uh, I want to do, I do want to make one or two comments about some accountability issues. So Dr. Boffman, this relates to some of the things that you mentioned with the grading and learning plan. Um, as much as I am very proud of all the great things we did this spring, given the circumstances. I, I also know that the data shows that our achievement, uh, student performance achievement, did have some gaps. And uh, as, as the chair of the Student Success Committee, uh, it's, it's absolutely prudent that I bring forth the notion to emphasize how student accountability has to take place during these times. Uh, with the three modalities, we have to create strong equity among these three modalities. We have to, as you mentioned, uh, have strong rigor, uh, great engagement, and, and true accountability among students. So I'm, I'm recommending to you to work with the TOSIS, to work with your CCC committees, to work with uh, YEA, and to work with the new academic committee that's going to be starting to really examine the grading and learning plan and make changes that are necessary to keep students accountable whether they are face-to-face, -face, whether they're doing a hybrid situation, or whether they're fully remote. Um, it's, it's absolutely cr critical that we don't widen that achievement gap even further. The, 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 the grading and learning plan the way it is, when students have accountabilities 
and, and items count, whether they're checkpoints, formatives, all the way through summatives. Um, if those changes aren't made, I'm fearful that the achievement gap will widen again. And we absolutely have to stay away from that. So um, that includes a couple of different things that have to happen, I believe, in the classroom or remotely or the hybrid situation. Uh, students have to be accountable daily. Teachers have to be accountable daily. And that teachers have to be accountable in regards to providing timely and really meaningful feedback to the students to let them know how they're doing, how they're progressing. If there's areas that are weaknesses, how can those be, be uh, turned into strengths? Um, again, I can't emphasize enough how crucial it is at this point. You know, everything given equal level and that equity is among those three modalities. And it, it starts ultimately with, with accountability. So I just wanted to make those comments. Thanks, Dexter. Um, <laughs> so I've been working in the hospital through all of this. You know, um, I had to be on a committee that did how we would use ventilators if we run out of ventilators. We don't want to be on that committee. I had to argue that a pregnant woman I thought had greater value than someone who wasn't pregnant if we had to shuffle ventilators. We had a plan in place that if we were overrun, the Yorkville building out here would be used as a hospital site. I was terrified that I would have patients in the rooms with no ventilators or no way to give them oxygen. Um, that was really scary stuff when all this first started. Um, we've learned a lot since then. And I think everybody in the room and everybody in education should read the CDC's recommendations that came out this week. I think there's really important information that's there. And I think one of the most important things when I get asked about all this is that we have to get back to who's really at risk. Who are we protecting? Who is in danger? Right now, as we see the statistics, it's pretty clear. Our biggest group of people that we're taking care of are right, 18 and unders. Right now, out of all positive tests, they only represent 6% of positive tests. It's a very low number. Out of those, severe disease is less than 0.1% worldwide. I think it's important we remember that as we go through this, because there are going to be kids who are not going to wear the mask. And there are going to be kids who aren't going to keep their hands from other kids. I suspect there's going to be kids who are going to spit because we read about it on the internet. There's going to be kids who are going to do stupid things in the bathrooms. We all understand that. But I do think we remember that their relative risk is very, very low. Our biggest risk are for our people who work there, our teachers, our staff, and so on. So if we look at those numbers and the statistics on that, for those people between 25 and 55, again, the risk of COVID infection for severe disease is very, very low. As I just have mentioned, we do have a number of people that do have comorbidities and they will have to pay foundation fees that come out. But for the bulk of us, we know now from looking at all the data in the schools that have gone back to things, Denmark, Germany, Taiwan, we know who we're watching out for. We have that information. So I hope we can reassure people when they go back to school that while there's a risk, there are going to be people who are going to get infected. There are going to be people who are going to show up for school with a sore throat. There are going to be people who are going to show up that have a fever when they get to school. But I think we all have to remember, while this is an illness, and while this is a severe illness, and while this is a very scary thing, for those of us who are working in this environment, the bulk of us are not that big of a risk. The people we should be looking out for, the people we need to protect, are elderly, and the people with severe comorbidities. Unfortunately, for those people over 70 years old, and really 75 years old, this is a very serious, very frank disease. Um, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's unfortunate, and working in the hospital, I had a nice sore on my nose from wearing PPE for two weeks, and I don't know if 
we have the other doctors or nurses in here, but it is not a lot of fun when you see people who can't breathe. It's awful. It's really an awful thing. And it's scary and it's terrible. So as we put all this together and we put this framework together, I think we should be really thinking more in terms of us as a community of people and who we're looking out to protect. And the people that we should be protecting are those who are at highest risk. And as we go through it, as we think about it, as we talk about it, we are going to have places that we're going to have to make adjustments. We're going to have to make changes. But you know, as we look around the room today, I hate to tell us, but not all of us are six feet apart. Not everybody's wearing their mask correctly. Not everybody, we're the adults here. So the kids are going to have problems. They're going to struggle. It's going to be difficult. Our kids that are kindergartners and wearing their little masks are going to be hard. But I saw a kid today who's seven who hasn't had the speech therapy, who has not cried in the room today because he had a huge setback. He was having a great deal of difficulty talking in a different district. He loved Mrs. So-and-so, and Mrs. So-and-so hasn't been teaching him, and she's been working with him. His speech was awful. Um, what do we do with that? You know, this is the stuff that scares me as a physician. I'll be honest, and these guys have heard me talk about it. I'm not scared really all the time about the COVID. I'm scared what we're leaving behind after this and what's going to happen to the kids. I, I'm terrified that we're going to have kids who are never going to go out for sports again. They're never going to go out for band again. They're not going to have opportunities at theater again. I think these are awful things. And they're going to go on and move forward. I think the consequences of that is going to outweigh 10 years from now what the consequences of COVID are going to be. So as we move forward and as we talk about it and as we think about how we have to protect ourselves and others, think about this community, think about who's at risk. Remember that we are going to have mistakes. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is I'm very proud to be part of this district. You know, my clientele comes from help Cal, Marseille, Nooka, all over the place. And I can assure you that what we've done in this school, I'm extremely proud. People are jealous of what our people have done. I'm very proud to say that I work with Dr. Shen for all this. So again, I applaud you guys. I applaud everybody who's going to be in the school. And again, if we work together as a community, I think we'll all get some response. Thanks. Did I make any sense? I don't like so You did a good job. I'm much better at reading these paragraphs. I didn't say you were old, Bob. I said age. Oh. Uh, you're, you're doing an awesome job, and I really appreciate sure, your sure. expertise in what you present to the community because I do think that. It is who we have to protect and, and, and we're adult work and the consequences in what we are leaving behind is very, very significant. That social I, I really love the idea with your two committees monitoring what's going on, Tim, that we're gonna have some of those controls in place. I love the fact the dedication we have of, of the board for actually caring about it and, and being as the ability to go ahead and adapt and change quickly, which I think is really important today. There is there are no guarantees but tomorrow's in the ring. But I think we can't live in fear. And I think, unfortunately, we've created a society right now that we actually do live in fear. And we're thinking the worst, and the whole world's going to end. What's that all going to end? And these kids need to be back in school. They, they need the social learning. They, they need the, the, I hate to say it, the touching, the hugging, all, all these things they're missing. These are things that, that, that are really, really tough. I'm happy we've got the curriculum that we have that we can hopefully give at least a portion of what, what they actually need. Uh, I want to give credit to, to Heather and her, her team. I mean, probably one of the most forgotten parts of education is maintaining all of our buildings and the things that are being done. And your staff does an actually outstanding job. And, I mean, every time you, you take a look around, everything is always clean, it's always neat. Whether it be COVID or not, it, it's great. I look at Mandy and her team and how they handle the finances. The fact that we, we have money to adapt to a certain uh, number of things, that, that we aren't desperate, that we, we try to invest back into the community. Our kids have their phone books, they have the tools that they need. And I think they were working collectively together. And I, I, I appreciate being on this board. Thank you very much. I guess just real quick, something that I was concerned about, obviously, uh, being a teacher myself, going to year number 22, um, after kind of listening to our work session last week, was making sure that we did have accountability on all three levels um, or all three different modalities. Um, uh, that really resonated with me. So I, I definitely think that's something we need to stay on top of. As far as the students, um, with us ending as badly as we did this year, uh, one thing that I had decided to do, uh, which I, I normally wouldn't do, but uh, 
I kept my Google Classroom open this summer. And I said, if you need to chat with me, obviously all through Zoom, so that it, it could be recorded, so there's not like you know, there's nothing like that. If y'all need to get a hold of me, definitely make sure you, you email me and say, hey, Mr. Sutner, a couple of us would like to Zoom and talk with you about you know things that come at the end of the year. You know, if you need to talk, obviously, like I said, make sure you do this because uh, I've had uh, you know my classes with about 35 kids. And I had literally at the end of the year probably about 10 kids average each class whose anxiety was through the roof about just not just being stuck at home. Um, as far as the teachers, obviously our mental health is playing into this as well. I would not be remiss. I mean, I would be remiss if I had passed on that. I mean, obviously I'm a teacher myself. Um, I thought about it obviously. Um, the one thing that I, I thought um, in our, our department, the building I teach with, we meet every week as a department. And I think it's probably more because we miss the social interaction of actually seeing adults and being, you know, so we do our Zoom things. And uh, one conversation that we have had is if you think about, like, you know, obviously I said I've been teaching for 22 years, a lot of people in my school, same boat. So you're used to it, and, and, and some, you know, some people, some teachers, they do their doctorates on certain sort of types of best practices. Well, a lot of the best practices that we've had, that, you know, that we've been implemented and we've had ingrained in our, in our, in our brain have really had to kind of flip flop here, unless I'm missing something over uh, the past three months when it comes to like, uh, you know, buildings and um, you know how they have to, how they function, and then there's just something as simple as how. Uh, teachers discipline, you know, you're not going to be using proximity as a, as a thing anymore. You know, you're not going to be sending all your kids to the door at the same time. So it's just little, just little things like that, that, uh, you know, we've kind of brainstormed as teachers. And uh, again, it's just a big change right now in kind of what we've done best practice wise. But, uh, you know, obviously, I think just having been in this area in education for as long as I have. You know, I think that the uh, resiliency will end up winning out over that. Like I said, this plan, um, I, I, obviously, you all put a tremendous amount of time in it and should be applauded for it. So, uh, thank you. Just quick, and uh, it's really, I'm not going to repeat anything anybody said. It's, it's really fine. The one thing, though, that I guess I think mitigation still is, is important. I mean, school districts that have done well globally have had a very low incidence. But then again, you can look at Israel, who had a disaster. We just opened it up and let everybody go back, and there was no mitigation in place. And that didn't go well. Most of the research shows that any COVID that does show up in a school doesn't usually come from the school, it's from the home to the school. And, and that's why our parents are going to be really big in this. I, when I see kids in, in the clinic all the time, when the parents are excited about wearing their mask and they're passing it on to the child, they're basically how cute they look, the little ones, it's never a problem. It's the parents that come in there moaning about wearing a mask where the kid is a problem and they're pulling in the mask and pulling it down. So it's a total community effort, and there's no doubt about that. How, you, how the teachers present that in the classroom is going to make a difference. And how the parent presents that at home. And as we speak with our parents and we explain to them what's going to be required, I hope we can tell them that it's your example that's going to set the tone for your child. And, and that's part of the educational process we have to have. Because you're always going to have a few here, you're right, that are kind of difficult times with us. But in general, I think if we can apply mitigation in a safe way, uh, in a general way, and we have a positive attitude towards it both our educational leaders and from the home community, we're going to have a lot less problems. And I think the key is for people to be agile, you don't have to be flexible. You know, even in all of this, this if you've read any, I know you're all avid readers, this isn't a black swan. It's not. This will change education forever. So, um, you know, find opportunities, learn more about yourself. Every single person in this room tonight is really your, your, you are these children's most trusted voice. Don't underestimate that. 
I, I found myself going back to teaching during this crisis as well. I have never enjoyed teaching more than ever because the students need you and the students find their teachers. So be flexible, learn, look for opportunities, and you have, there isn't anybody in this room who's not going to support you and listen to you and come up with a solution. I think that's how we're going to get through this. All right, so we need a motion on the table. I need a resolution. I need to read the most important resolution. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the motion to approve the resolution for the District 115 2020 21 Fall Reopening Plan and Remote e Learning Plan as presented. Second. Moved and second. Any additional comments? Let's take a roll call on this. Dr. Kasula? Yes. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Dr. Brunner? Yes. Mr. Kravlitz? Yes. Mr. Seppner? Yes. Ms. Shields? Yes. Dr. Burke? Yes. All right. And then on um, to 2021 calendar modification. So this is in support of that. So we are, you can see the, the calendar recommendations. Uh, one of them is to replace the November 3rd election day, which is now a non student attendance day. Which is non district uh, attendance day. Um, and we are suggesting that that moves to the end of the school year. So the last day of student attendance would be May 27th, but then into the end of day on the Friday, the 28th, for our employees. And additionally, we are asking that the first day of school be moved to August 20th. So we would have three and two days, and then we would have August 18th and 19th. Have remote learning many days for our staff, and then we would come back on August 31st with one additional remote planning day. Those days do not have to be made up, um, and it still would provide us two remaining days uh, to be used at our discretion. Okay, any other motion, please? Motion to approve the uh, 2021 uh, District 115 calendar modifications as presented. Second. Move that yeah, I think some people might wonder why we, you know, why would you put a, uh, a day at the end of the year for like an institute day? Uh, you know, some people might think, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You're having one at the end of the year. Um, and the, the district that I've, districts that I've been in, the last one, the current one, and now, um, we, we didn't do it this year, but we had done it in previous years, and we were actually able to get a very good jump on the following year. Uh, for what we wanted to do in that uh, that uh, institute day, so I just don't want people to think that that institute day is just you're showing up, you're showing up, staying high, and packing in for the following year. These teachers are definitely putting in work for the following year, so I just want to make that point. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And we have some AP psychology research. Yeah, this was an item that was uh, discussed uh, back in May, and the item was placed on display for 30 days. Motion to approve the purchase of the advanced placement AP psychology resources. Second. Move and second additional time. Roll call, please. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Mr. Sepner? Yes. Dr. Brenner? Yes. Dr. Kasula? Yes. Mr. Kazowitz? Yes. Ms. Shields? Yes. And we have approval of the 90% current level for District 115 annual property insurance for you all, the FY21. Do so need a motion? Motion to approve the uh, switch to a 90% co-insurance uh, level for District 115 uh, uh, FY21 uh, property insurance renewal. Second. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Kasowitz? Yes. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Dr. Brunner? Yes. Yes. Mr. Sepner? Yes. Ms. Shields? Yes. Yes. And then last, we have photography vendor selection approval. Any motion? Motion to approve the uh, photography committee's uh, recommendation to enter into a three year contract with uh, HR Imaging to provide photography services beginning on July 28th, 2020, and ending on June 30th, 2023. Second. I just want to thank um, Mindy and Mike and the team, uh, as well as 
preparing to donate their time as well to serve on these committees. But I think it's a much or unlike some other districts, uh, I think the value of collaboration, the value of community input, uh, and getting people involved in the work that we do is so essential. Uh, it's just another example of, of the importance of that and, and the positive outcomes that, that come as a result. So, thank you. And uh, we'll need a roll call for this. Mr. Kopolis? Yes. Dr. Schumacher? Yes. Dr. Brenner? Yes. Dr. Kitchell? Yes. Mr. Stefner? Yes. Ms. Shields? Yes. And then we have one item for new business request for personnel and resources to support funds. Yeah, so now that the um, plans have been approved by the board, um, we're coming to you for a number of different items. Um, and these are really not to exceed items for the year and, and will be reviewed um, at, at the end of the year. So as we, when we look at tutoring hours of 1,562 hours um, for $50,000, um, we are looking for not to exceed for 10 custodians. Um, we have on there $650,000 for custodians. The greatest hope for that number is that we can look at when we start scheduling individuals, um, where we could schedule them lots and periods of time. Uh, so maybe they're part-time employees or um, five-hour employees, whatever that is. So again, that's a not to exceed number. There's two lunch distribution staff. For those families who pick e-learning or hybrid, um, we're gonna look to still provide, we can still purchase lunch. Um, for multi-day meals and pick them up from a centralized location. So having staff available to do that. We talked about the lunchroom recess supervision. Uh, and Nick mentioned how we're going to have different zones. And so we're going to have increased lunchroom areas, especially as you get to the middle and the high school level. So we're looking for more support and supervision. We're going to try and look at staff who might be interested to do an internal supervision to the school day, much like they do now at the, the high school and middle school, um, and sometimes at the elementary level. Um, but there's um, $140,000 for supervision. Um, we're asking for a 0.5 health coordinator um, to assist with obviously the health related um, training, day to day protocols, substituting when we need them. Need him or her. Um, we're also asking for one full time substitute nurse for $31,000. 12 self certification monitors. Um, as the board is aware, uh, prior to the school day beginning, all staff and students will be required to self certify, both from a temperature as well as a symptom check. So we need to have individuals that are on campus. We receive the report ahead of time so that when Tim Schimp or Jason Sefner shows up to work and they didn't self certify, we're stopping them at the door and we're doing the check there and either tell them they can come in or they have to return home. Uh, so we need monitors for each of those buildings um, to do that. Like I said, those are do not um, exceed number. So we'll obviously remain. Try to remain fiscally responsible to the board, to our, our taxpayers. Um, you know, Mike and Vinny have, have done a tremendous job of tracking COVID related expenses. I think it's important for the board to know that if we go back from March to end of June, there's been about a $300,000 increase in expenses for COVID related items. As we move forward, you know, where we're looking with the numbers that I've provided, as well as the things that Heather has been talking about, plexiglass and shields and masks, and, um, you know, we're looking at about a $1.6 million uh, worth of expenses to start the school year as we move into the year and throughout the year. Um, much of that has to do with personnel. When you think about items I just listed with custodian, you think about substitute nurse, you think about substitute. Um, the, the board approved earlier today um, with the pay increase. Uh, and there's going to be some certainly um, unknowns out there that are going to come up 
as the year goes on. Um, we're anticipating right now about 262,000 of reimbursement from the CARES Act. Um, but again, it's a small dent into the amount of expenses. I think it's also fair to say that none of that 1.6 or 1.8 takes into account any of the cost savings. Or when we look at the, the, the cost of new teachers versus those who left, there might be a $200,000 savings. When you look at some of the strategic plan items that we haven't dedicated money for, for some of the contingency dollars. Um, so when, you, when we, we provide a number of expenses, it doesn't mean the sky is falling with our overall budget. And it's certainly not money we are planning for or excited to spend, but it's the reality to get kids and staff back in school and to keep them safe and to be able to minimize achievement gaps and, and support the mental health of, of our employees and our kids. So um, we might be coming back asking for, you know, you think about social workers, think about counselors, think about the needs of, of our staff and our students. I don't know what that's going to look like in September or October. Um, and that's why those committees will be so instrumental to be saying we need more support in these areas or less support or, or moving support. You know, we talked about that. There might be times where we're taking existing employees and they're doing other work. Um, so it's not always about expenses. It's not always about new, but it, it's really to be different. But, uh, I think it's, it's fair for the board to see what we're asking and somebody for our community to see what we're asking and know the, the true cost behind it. Need our Welcome to approve the request for additional staffing and resources as presented. Second. 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 The way the celebrations are news. Uh, what is significant is uh, from my athletic and um, IESA at the middle school level, we did the word that that is the, the canceling that for the fall. Um, so that is significant um, for, for that age level of group of kids. Um, it's anticipated that IHSA is going to meet uh, Wednesday this week. So we will see what direction and parameters come with that. But we don't have any other information regarding what that's going to look like. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of talk, but nothing definitive. Um, we are working closely with our music department um, to provide opportunities for kids this school year. Um, you know, Heather's been in contact with Victor and Nick and I and Melinda have all met. Um, you know, we are ordering masks for our music. We have specific music-related masks. So we can holes for your instruments and, and such. And uh, we're also working with our music teacher and Victor to provide shields uh, for our instructors um, at request of them. So um, a lot of unique things going on, but um, a lot of unanswered uh, questions related to band and fine arts and extracurricular. I did have a, I meet weekly with the Tenham County and regional superintendent as well as the group up north, but today we had the town county one. Um, and there are some districts that are discussing, even if IHSA does not provide a fall season of such, they would like to provide intramurals um, and other activities. Um, I think that's something we'll have to have a discussion with the board about over the next few weeks. Uh, certainly, we don't want to risk um, or you know, provide an increased risk to our students. And uh, if IHSA and, and other organizations are, are shying away from it. But just so you know that other districts are doing that or looking to do that. Um, I haven't talked to our high school or our middle school administration um, where they stand on that or what their thoughts are, what they've heard. But just so you know that is, that is out there. But our, our regional office has been a great source of support and direction and finding answers for us. Uh, as well as the other trying to prevent it. So, a good networking and, and everyone's feeling the same thing. If there's any reassurance, our parents are feeling the same thing, other communities, 
our staff and administration, and certainly our, our kids and, and board of education. So, well, and thank you to the board for all your time as well and your thought leadership and pushing back and a lot of hard questions. But we appreciate it. In the spirit of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, Dr. Kemp. And then we have an executive session. We don't anticipate any action, uh, but we need that whole motion. Gotcha. Yeah, That's your job, Dr. Kapula. Uh, motion to move into executive session for the purpose of consulting the appointment of the line compensation, fiscal performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body, including counsel of the public body, including hearing testimony on the complaint lodged against. Take about five minutes and then we're going to ask everyone um, basically to leave. <laughs> you can go next door. The Lorraine serves there. If you want to wait, nothing's going to come out of it. Thank you, everybody.